CEOs, but we just want to build a community of all the folks inside these large organizations that are struggling and pushing to drive innovation. So that's really why we're all here. Um, we'd ask, you know, be open-minded, share, ask questions, um, because this time is really for all of you um, and just a chance to get you in with your peers. Um, so maybe I'll just give a little bit of, of context. Oh, that's me. You've seen enough of me. Um, so the you know agenda for today is uh, we have uh, the founder of GSV, Michael Moe, coming in in a couple minutes to share his perspective on some of the technology and cultural trends that are redefining industries across the globe. We're going to do what we call an off-the-record roundtable session, um, where we're all just going to get the chance to kind of ask some questions, share some best best practices and challenges, uh, and we you know all of you filled out some applications and some context to come here, where you actually put a bunch of questions out that you would love to get feedback and insight from the group on. So we're just going to be giving everyone a chance to kind of talk through those and discuss. We then have a founders panel where we have three CEOs of, you know, early kind of mid-stage startups uh, that are working with large enterprise and sharing some of their perspectives of what's worked, what hasn't, um, the advice they might have from you and the advice you might have from them. And just to continue the conversation, we'll then have a networking and happy hour where we'll have a bunch of the startups from our community around and get a chance for you all to talk, but also to see some different perspectives. Uh, so I think most of you are probably familiar with GSV Labs. Those that aren't, um, we are an innovation platform based here and in Boston. We have an in-house community of about 170 startups. We have an online community uh, in addition to that of another 250. Uh, we've graduated about 800 startups to our center since 2015 um, and just have a real great kind of global audience of enterprise, startups, governments, nonprofits, um, and really try and create an ecosystem where innovation thrives. Um, and, you know, as, as I mentioned, as we've done work over the past couple years with large enterprise, we identified some kind of common denominators that seem to exist inside most of these organizations. Uh, and, and the four that we find most often um, are that a lot of really good innovation work is being done. Um, but it's siloed and it's happening in all these pockets throughout the company and there isn't the transparency and like the collaboration and the efficiency that most organizations have uh, deployed across every other part of their business other than the innovation kind of ecosystem. The second is there's a lack of clarity on methodologies and goals. Um, if you ask six people inside of your company what success looks like on a project, you're probably going to get six completely different answers. Um, and it creates a, a lot of difficulty in kind of moving quickly down the line. And then there's a fragmentation of tools and resources. Um, there's not a playbook. There's not a common infrastructure that everyone can use to drive these different projects. So people are left to kind of figure it out on themselves. And then finally, there's a lack of immersion and access to the constantly changing technology ecosystem. So as large enterprises trying to deal with AI, IoT, blockchain, quantum, kind of the intersection and convergence of all these trends, um, the people who are being charged with this innovation work aren't living in the trenches of it, and they're trying to really constantly catch up. And so our concept, and you know, this is something we'd love to get feedback on, uh, is we launched a new platform that's in alpha right now called GSV Immerse. And what it does is it takes everyone inside of an organization that's doing digital innovation work and puts them into one shared collaborative space where they can manage you know, everyone on their team that's doing this work. Um, they out of identifying new technology and getting work done. And so one of the follow-ups that you'll get in your inbox after this is a free account on Immerse. And we'd love anyone who has feedback or wants to give us any insight about everything that's horrible about it. Please, you know, let us know. And the team will take all of that and hopefully make it a little less horrible. Um, but with that, um, it's my pleasure to introduce Michael Moe, who's the founder of GSV uh, and this global kind of family of companies to share his perspective on global Silicon Valley megatrends. Thank you. I guess there's an easier way to get on stage, but um, good afternoon, everybody. So what Alec asked me to, to do, and, and, and I'm so glad you guys are here, is to give you um, a quick overview of GSV, the organization, uh, but more importantly, some of the huge trends we, we, uh, that, that we see going on in the innovation marketplace. So let me just quickly, GSV stands for Global Silicon Valley. And so while we're an investment platform based in Silicon Valley, a, a big part of our thesis is this innovation mindset that has made Silicon Valley such an amazing place is going global uh, and around the world. We want to connect Silicon Valley to this emerging global Silicon Valley and focused on the, f the industries of the future and the, what we call the stars of tomorrow. 
We also, a year ago, created a partnership with two firms, one HMC Capital, about $11 billion Latin America uh, asset manager, and then Clayton Dublier Rice, New York-based private equity firm, about $25 billion of assets under management. We think both that helps us from a geographic presence as well as other resources that helps us accelerate the platform that we have. At GSV, we've invested in a number of high growth um, businesses. We've invested about a billion dollars in the past eight years when we found the firm. Companies like Spotify, Dropbox, Lyft, Lime, which by the way is the fastest growing technology business in the history of, of the, the world as far as we know. Uh, Nextdoor, <coughs> Palantir are all investments that we've made um, over the past eight years. Uh, also Coursera, which is creating the world's learning platform. We also have a fund, GSV Acceleration, focused on education and innovation. Um, that fund uh, is focused on companies that have rapidly scaling business models, what we call weapons of mass instruction. Companies like Andela, uh, Vincenti Fox from Mexico, Matthew McConaughey. Uh, we had uh, President Bush, with, that's with Carlos Watson, which is a, both an investment uh, of ours in Aussie Media, but also a partner, uh, Richard Branson. Condoleezza Rice, Howard Schultz, who's the founder of Starbucks. GSV IQ is our research business out of India. We have a weekly publication on innovation and growth called Ada Apple. Um, that if you'd like to subscribe, it's free. Um, and then GSV Labs, which obviously you are in the the, uh, the middle of. And so GSV Labs is is obviously based here in the heart of Silicon Valley. We also have labs and uh, GSV labs in Boston and in partnership with Times of India and Delhi and Bangalore. Our goal over the next five years is to have 40 labs around the world connecting Silicon Valley to this emerging global Silicon Valley, which uh, creating this ecosystem around startups, investors, and corporations. Uh, about 170 startups here. Uh, $600 million has been raised for these startups since 2015. And so, you know, we, we love innovation, we love growth companies, but there's some realities of being um, an innovator and being a startup that I think is important to understand. So every day in America, there's 1,100 companies that are formed. Every day in America, 1,100 businesses fail. If you're an entrepreneur, uh, your company has only a 20% chance of surviving its first three years. Uh, in 2018, venture capitalists invested in 3,000 companies. In the 2018, just 93 companies, uh, venture-backed companies went public. Entrepreneurs are 70% more likely to have a heart attack, twice as likely to be divorced, three times likely to go bankrupt. What kind of nut would start a company? Okay? So see if you can name this nut. Ready? Lost his job in 32. Defeating the race for state legislature in 32. Failed in business in 33. He had a nervous breakdown in 41. Defeated in races for Congress in 43, Senate in 55, Vice President in 56, and Senate in 58. Can you name that nut? Abraham Lincoln. 16th President of the United States, arguably our, our, our finest. So here's some other, uh, the, 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 but the whole story of entrepreneurship is one of being setbacks and challenging conventional wisdom. So I'm going to go through some other nuts and see if you can uh, identify him. So this entrepreneur was told by his teachers that he was, too, he was uh, too stupid to learn anything. He was fired from his first two jobs for lack of productivity. You know who this is? Thomas Edison, 99% perspiration, 1% inspiration, the founder of the electric light bulb, the founder of the, uh, the, the uh, movie camera, the, fo the, fo the founder of many, many other innovative products and also the founder of General Electric, $80 million market cap. Okay, so this uh, entrepreneur was told by his Yale professor for his senior thesis, in order to earn better than a C, the idea must be feasible. This was his idea about a, a, a new airline. Do you know who this was? Yeah, Fred Smith from FedEx. And so Fred took his, uh, and he had a small inheritance, he took some venture capital money, and he started, he basically took his thesis paper from Yale and started Federal Express. And like most new enterprises, it took more time and more money. So he's down to his last $5,000 on a Friday. And do you know what he did? What any great entrepreneur would do, he went to Las Vegas, turned $5,000 into $27,000. Federal Express planes flew on Monday morning, and the rest is history. Literally doing whatever it takes today, $40 billion 
market cap company. So this uh, entrepreneur was dyslexic, who was turned down by 53 banks for a business loan. He was told by his uh, principal in high school that he was either going to be a millionaire or be in jail. You know who this is? This is Richard Branson, founder of eight different $1 billion plus businesses. Okay, this is, um, and this is like the greatest business book I've ever read. So this, this uh, entrepreneur was dropped by his JV partner, who then sued him. His first bank cut him off. His second bank had the FBI investigate him for fraud. Two creditors showed up at his headquarters on the same day to collect, so he spent the whole day keeping them in different rooms so they wouldn't run into each other. U.S. Customs then slapped him with a $10 million bill when he basically had no money. And then he, his, his star brand endorser died in a car crash, and his replacement wore a competitor's product on global TV. You know who this is? Phil Knight, just do it, $100 billion market cap. So, I mean, the point is, we, I, and, I, and I wasn't sure how many different stories like that we had here, um, because we have literally dozens that go on. Because that, that's not atypical, it's typical. Something also that is classic as it relates to um, being an entrepreneur is embracing change because things change and you know, over time they change a lot. So 200 years ago, to go from the East Coast to the West Coast would take a generation and you'd lose half your travel party. Today, when you go from New York to San Francisco, it takes six hours and if your Wi-Fi doesn't work, you're pissed off. 100 years ago, the innovation capital of the world was Detroit, Michigan, and Henry Ford was the Steve Jobs of his day. It's how, you know, that's where people from around the world came to kind of stake their claim on the future because that's where it was all happening in Detroit. 100 years ago, Silicon Valley, this is Silicon Valley. This is a picture from Silicon Valley. It was a bunch of apricot uh, and apple fields. And the farm was an academic institution nobody had heard about. Uh, that had just started 25 years before, that being Stanford. Detroit looks more like this today, although it's going through some renaissance. And obviously Silicon Valley is the home of many of the game-changing uh, game businesses that are changing the world. Probably the greatest change agent in the history of the world is, is uh, Gordon Moore, who came up with this thesis of computing power, who was going to double every couple of years, uh, over 50 years ago, what became known as Moore's Law. What's so fascinating about Moore's Law is that it's not actual scientific or physical law. Basically, it was Gordon Moore imposing his will upon an industry which transformed not only technology, but also tra transformed, uh, transformed society overall. Looking at the impact of technology in business, and moreover, um, looking at how things change over time, these were the five largest market cap companies in the world 50 years ago. IBM, AT&T, General Motors, Standard Oil, and Kodak. Two of those five companies went bankrupt in the next 50 years. The five largest market cap companies in the world today are Microsoft, Amazon, Apple, Alphabet, and Facebook, uh, which didn't exist 50 years ago. Number seven and eight are Alibaba and Tencent. And what's amazing about Alibaba and Tencent, not only that they're from China, but they didn't exist 20 years ago, nor did Facebook. Take a close look at this picture. So this is St. Peter's Square at the Vatican. Got it? Okay. Here's what it looks like today. So, um, so that picture was from 2005. This is today. What's, what's remarkable to me is in the environment where basically everybody became a photographer, right, with, their, with the phone they have, Kodak, which was founded in 1888, went bankrupt in 2011. Uh, by, by the way, Kodak had the patent on digital photography. That was the same year that uh, Facebook acquired Instagram for a billion dollars when they had 11 employees. So John Chambers, who was the chairman of Cisco, said, if you don't innovate fast, disrupt the industry, disrupt yourself, you'll be left behind. Larry Pace and lots of companies don't succeed over time. What do they fundamentally do wrong? They usually miss the future. And Jeff Bezos said, frankly, I'm more concerned about two guys in a garage when talking about competition. And not, uh, in, you know, not uh, uh, in the direct correlation, see corporate venture capital is growing at a, 
uh, unprecedented rate of over 33 percent CAGR, reaching 29 billion in 2017. So I'm going to talk to close this talk. I'm going to talk about three gravitational forces that are shifting, that are creating um, opportunity and challenges. So you, I think the saying either you disrupt or be disrupted is absolutely um, fundamental. But the first gravitational shift I want to talk about is digital natives rule. So this is the class of 2020. So this is a group of students that came in the school. Um, obviously, they, they came in. Uh, they, they came. They, they came into uh, school or existence. What, what am I not saying? This. They were freshmen two years ago. They'll graduate uh, a year from the spring. And what's so interesting about this class? They're different than any class before them. So. They, they were born 21 years ago. There you go. I do the math really easy. So also 21 years ago. So this generation of students, you know, thinks about things different, does things different. So just the whole way they operate is completely um, unusual for people that came before them. And so also 21 years ago is when Google was born in a garage by these with these two people as their parents, Larry, Larry Page and, and Sergey Brin. So this class of 2020 has grown up in a world where basically all the information in the world is available to them at their fingertips for free. My generation, water was free um, and, and the information was difficult. Also, uh, 21 years ago, Steve Jobs came back for his second tour of duty at, at Apple with the original goal of putting a, a computer on everybody's desktop, ultimately put a computer in your pocket. So for this class of 2020, a smartphone, it's not a smartphone, it's just a phone, and they do everything with it. From getting the transportation, to getting food, to buying products, to consuming entertainment. Not only are they getting everything off their phone, but they're getting it when they want it. So this on-demand mentality is absolutely fundamental in how they live. And so that's a direct consequence, you know, the binge watching where you don't have to wait a week to see your favorite series, you can watch the show repeatedly all, all night long if, if you want. This class of 2020 and really millennials overall don't like to own anything. So you see home ownership has fallen substantially, um, but, it's, but it's everything. Last year, there were more cars sold to people 75 years or older than 18 to 24 year olds. They also remember how their family um, lost their, their, their parents lost the, the job that they had had their entire career um, with, the, with the financial crisis. And again, the Department of Labor estimates that this class of 2020 will have 15 careers between the time they graduate from college and the time they retire, if they ever retire. And one of those jobs could be part of the gig economy as a Lyft driver or an Uber driver. Second gravitational shift is about digital disruption and automation. So this is Mark Andreessen, who founded Netscape, and uh, basically commercializing the internet uh, in 1994. So the digital tracks that have been laid over the last 25 years now have 3.7 billion people on the internet. You've seen uh, as, a, as a result of, of Moore's law continuing in the last uh, 25 years, you've seen the cost of computing going down 99%, so it's effectively free. Storage is infinite and essentially free. There's now 2.6 billion smartphones, 258 billion app downloads last year. Also in 1994 is when Amazon was born, we originally buying physical text, physical books online shipped to your house. In 1994, Sears Roebuck is one of the most important retail companies in the world, it had a $16 billion market value then. Today it's bankrupt. And today, Amazon has a $900 billion market cap. But it wasn't just Sears. If you look at you know, large uh, retailers such as Target and Best Buy, Macy's, Sears, JCPenney, Kohl's, they've lost nearly 50% of their value in the last uh, 10 years, over 100, you know, almost $100 billion. And department stores have shed 100,000 jobs since October 2016. The good news is that e-commerce is creating jobs too. So there's 355,000 new jobs created since 2007 by e-commerce companies. But just as fast as jobs are being created, technology has taken them away. Amazon, again, the major disruptor, has over 100,000 robots uh, working in their warehouses today. 
Chinese firms buy bought uh, 90,000 industrial robots per year, expect to be 175,000 by next year. And so McKinsey estimates that there's 350 million global manufacturing warehouse workers, all of their jobs are in play. But it's not just blue collar workers, it's also white collar workers. McKinsey also estimates that there's 12 million middle school jobs eliminated by 2025 uh, just in the United States alone. And those jobs are things like managing money. So it's estimated that $7 trillion is going to be managed by robots by 2025. Already, the Associated Press uh, does financial analysis quarterly on 3,000 companies using robots. So if you think about what the future could look like, it's basically money is going to be managed, making decisions by robots uh, that are getting input from other robots. Add it all up, and it's estimated that 50% of all jobs that exist today uh, could be replaced in the next 20 years. So people like Mark Zuckerberg, smart people like Mark Zuckerberg, said he should be a coder because basically there's insatiable demand for coding jobs. And in fact, there's 1.2 million computer science job openings by 2020 estimated. Harvard Business Review said data science is the sexiest job of the 21st century. It's a sexy job because there's a huge demand imbalance for people that have that skill set and the demand by corporations that are looking for people that uh, have, are data scientists. The problem with this logic is this chart. So basically, computers are on an exponential curve, and human capabilities are on a linear curve. And we're here. So what this means is pretty soon, technology is going to replace the technologist. Or it's not just white-colored workers, and not blue-colored workers. It's also the no-color workers whose jobs are at risk. So the killer jobs today could be killed tomorrow. And what we know is that as sure as the sun comes up in the east, automation is going to continue to eat jobs. But it doesn't eat work. And so part of this is reimagining what the future of work is going to look like and where the jobs of tomorrow are going to be and what kind of skills you need and what kind of knowledge you need. Last gravitational shift I want to talk about is the global Silicon Valley. Um, I would also, I mean, I'd, I'd love to talk about the future of work and knowledge workers, but I think you'd get tired of me talking as much. But we, we do see that as a huge gravitational shift, too. So the, the, the last gravitational shift I want to talk about is the global Silicon Valley. So if you look at the old innovation map, it looked like this. In places like London, you know, sort of the attitude about innovation and entrepreneurship was, you know, risk isn't my cup of tea. If the queen doesn't like it, why should I? You know, there wasn't a lot of entrepreneurship and innovation historically in London. You get to New York, not a lot different or better. The attitude in New York is, you know, if it's such a good idea, why hasn't it been done already? You move uh, west, get to Minneapolis where I grew up, a little bit more innovative mindset. Um, the, the attitude was, looks promising, let's test it, and then let's test it some more, and let's test it some more from there. And then you get move out west, to San Francisco and the attitude about a new idea is, can I write you a check? And then you move all the way to China with the attitude in Shanghai is great idea, now it's my idea. <laughs> but what's, what's super exciting is you're seeing innovation basically explode around the world in these new markets that um, basically are embracing innovation. Technology is enabling it to some degree, but so is the new landscape and the future of work. What, what a lot of people coming out of college said the best job that they can have is the one they create for themselves. I wrote a book a couple years ago called The Global Silicon Valley Handbook. It's a little bit tongue in cheek, but it maps out the 50 top innovation markets around the world looking at a variety of statistics, everything from angel investments to what the university system was in a, uh, in a, in a marketplace, quality of life, and so forth. And, and with that book, um, we, I don't know how many people watch the HBO show Silicon Valley. Does anybody watch Silicon Valley? OK, so this is the proprietor of, of the uh, incubator on Silicon Valley, Ehrlich Bachman, also T.J. Miller. Um, and he got a copy of the book. And here's what he said about it. He said, one of the most ridiculous but informative books I've ever read. But, so I'll take that as an endorsement. Anyway, so what we see, though, in, in, in wrapping up, is this, this uh, mindset is spreading around the world from Austin to Boston, from Chicago to Sao Paulo, 
from Mumbai to Shanghai to Dubai. And that's what we call the Global Silicon Valley. And that's what we're very excited to be a part of with this innovation ecosystem. So as we talk about how this all changes, the late, great Muhammad Ali said, impossible is not a fact, it's an opinion. And I think that's the, the bottom line in terms of the mindset that has to happen about how we accomplish some of these uh, important but seemingly stretched goals. Thank you. Uh, sure, sorry. Sure, sure. I was just trying to leave stage as fast yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, before people start throwing stuff at me. Um, and maybe I'll just throw one out there first, but we'd love to hear from the audience. As, as you look at kind of some of the technology verticals or you know, market verticals and business model innovations that are happening, and you look kind of five years down the line, uh, what are some of the opportunities that are getting you most excited? Well, I mean, first of all, um, when you, when you look at AI, um, it, what we see with AI is not specific companies. We see it embedded basically in almost every company in of every industry. So just as a fundamental mega trend, um, AI is, it, it's been an interesting place for a long time, but it was sort of science fiction-y. And now it's becoming ex extraordinarily real, and I think it's transforming, transformative. You know, blockchain, again, I think is a transformative platform that's coming and everybody focused on the cryptocurrency and the boom and bust and everything else. But often when you see that type of activity, it's an indicator that something important is going on. And certainly we believe, I believe, that blockchain is going to be a transformative shift that takes place, not only in the financial services industry, but in almost everything you can think of, from real estate to education to healthcare. Uh, that's another uh, incredibly um, important area. You know, we look at you know, education as a fundamental um, uh, you know, uh, booming need. And when you look at the, this reality of jobs that are being replaced and the fact that this inequality that's been created, not just in Silicon Valley, not just the United States, but really around the world, you know, and somewhat um, um, uh, catalyzed by technology, where you're seeing basically it's almost a winner take all. You're, so you're seeing the shift. And so the only way to change that dynamic is either is either through a um, kind of a political shift, which, which I think is harder to see, or you find, figure out ways to have more people to participate in the future, and that's really education. So I think education is certainly an important place, and I think probably the last um, area that I'd mentioned is, the, is this um, is, is technology and wellness and health, uh, which I think is going to, again, you start, you're seeing little, little pits and pieces of it that get pretty um, exciting today, but I think we look five years from now. I think it could make a major difference in terms of quality of life and, and how you see people uh, healthier and happier. Any, any questions from the group? Yeah, I was wondering about uh, geographical expansion and how you think about that in terms of the technologies that you're, uh, you, you mentioned that, but in terms of the companies that, um, that would be more um, open to this kind of uh, model. Like because, you know, abroad it's, it's, a, it, it's not, Silicon Valley has a different mentality, and yep. uh, it's, it's hard to translate that into, into other cultures sometimes. It is. So what we're looking to do, um, one, in order to expand with GSV Labs, there's no, there's no you know, there, every place around the world basically has this hunger for innovation and entrepreneurship. I mean, it's just a, it's a global phenomenon. So we think the market markets for labs are, are very open-ended. To your point, how do we select or how to determine what's, what's right for us, where we can add value? I mean, there's a number of things, but one is we're looking for partners. It would be, I've been to China, um, I guess, 15 times in the last two and a half years. And the one thing I know about China is the more I go, the less I know, right? But it's the most exciting place on Earth in terms of the change and the, the ambition and hunger for, uh, for, for, for things. But we'd be we'd get our head handed to us trying to go to China alone. So we're looking for partners that have aligned interests. Um, universities are an important place. If you're trying to find the talent, uh, you know, universities are going to be a, a great place to be hunting. And so we're looking to how align with you know, key universities and key sectors that we care about. Um, so I think I'm probably, uh, I'm probably uh, I mean, so for example, I mean, if we're interested in AI, 
you know, and, and AI, is, as, I, as I said, it's important here in the future. You know, we want to see where AI, you know, where's, where, where's there an ecosystem around AI that we can, you know, connect into and be a facilitator like we are here in Silicon Valley with labs. And so, you know, kind of mapping out the world and in terms of both partners and where there's some real expertise, um, that's, that's a big driver of how we're, lo how we're looking at it. So, uh, Michael, thank you for, for having us here. It's, it's an amazing, pre amazing presentation. Thank you for GS, GSV. I have two questions. Number one is, could you share with us, like, every company, they have a tipping point where they make or they, 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 they break. Uh, sometimes they have more than one, but, but if you could share with us, like, when was the GSV tipping point, number one? Second question about, we talk about how to dis uh, disrupt yourself before somebody does. Like, I used to work with John Chambers in the past. But um, let's talk about the VC world. VC world is also in a disruption. World. Companies, they change the landscape for seed and A round. And now for late rounds, we have uh, big companies, SoftBank and many others, like investing big time worldwide and also here. How do you see this VC world? five years out, maybe 10 years out, do you see yeah. like change? On the tipping point, first, I don't think we've had our tipping point. Um, we've gone through a number of different challenges at GSV as we've grown the business um, over the past eight years. Um, I'm very proud of the platform we're building, but you know, we're, we're, I, I, you know, we're, we're, we've got many things to do and we've got a lot of ambition. Um, but my experience with companies is it's not, it, it almost, it's not that they face one big tipping point or hurdle. It's like there's like three. There's like three near-death experiences where, you know, you can't believe the company survived, but they do. They pull somehow they pull their way out of it, and and then they go and thrive, right? Um, and so that just kind of goes with the territory. And I think of the, the ways that we're building this, and I've, it all starts with people. I'm very proud of the team that that we have here. Um, this the, the give me the, the so the the, the, the future of yeah. So one of the most ironic things about the venture capital industry is how um, little innovation goes on. I mean, most of these models are exactly the same. They basically are smart people with good education that hang out a shingle and say, give us your money, and, and then they go invest it. Um, where you, you don't see a lot of new models really trying to disrupt things. I'll say an Andreessen Horwitz, for example, um, I admire greatly in terms of I think they've brought some new twist to the, the, the venture capital model, and therefore... You know, people hate them, but but they're they're very good people, and they're doing a lot of good things. And I think they are innovative. I think Y Combinator is a, is an innovative model that's doing interesting things, and we hope we're doing interesting, and innovative things. You know, here with GSV and with GSV Labs and with conferences and the different things that we're we're trying to do. So I think, frankly, um, the VC industry isn't any different than other industries, uh, which is you know if you don't innovate, if you don't get better, you get worse. And so I think, I think you're going to see a number of innovative models that, that, that stand out five years from now. And I think there will be firms that maybe don't keep up with it. Yeah, I, I don't think I can, ex we actually do have um, uh, signed deals in, in certain places, but I don't think they're announced yet. So I don't, I, I shouldn't uh, disclose before they're disclosed, <laughs> before they're disclosable. Um, but, you know, I think we've, we've, we've mapped out effectively the United States and the world, um, you know, in, in terms of what we think are the most important areas. Um, we're rapidly trying to build um, are more knowledge and more better relationships, but you know certainly China is a place that we have a huge interest in. India, we have a huge interest in. We have a partnership with Times of India. In the United States, I think you, you know you're looking at areas where there's a lot of great academic institutions and looking for partners that we could be brought into markets to to be successful. Um, that's 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 our focus. As I said, we've got a couple um, near-term things. That I think if they ha they haven't been announced yet, I don't think they have. They'll be announced shortly, um, but they're along the lines of what I said in terms of, you know, industries and academics and partners. So I can't disclose more. I just think I'd get in trouble. Please. You talk about uh, technology's ability to bring education to more people and other positive effects, but at the same time, AI having this ability to um, eliminate a lot of jobs. So I'm curious. 
this, if you net out the positive and the negative, where do you come down on sort of the near-term future of these technologies? Pessimistic, optimistic, yeah. is it not written yet? Well, it, it's definitely a double-edged sword. And I think, again, whether you, if you choose to embrace it, I think it can be really positive. I mean, AI is going to have profound impact in a positive way on helping people learn more on an individ individualized basis, um, on a real-time basis. Um, and you're seeing a lot of interesting things done that can really help society. But there's no question, AI is going to be taking away a lot of jobs. And by the way, um, it's jobs that people don't even, can't even believe that they'll be taken away. Um, so my, my, my net net is, one, it's like gravity, so you can fight it. Uh, or you just say, okay, well, there's gravity, so what do you do about it? And so I'm actually positive because, you know, it could be totally, if we just sit back and sort of let it happen, you know, it'll be, it could be very bad. But if we embrace it, you know, I think it can be very, you know, very exciting for society going forward. So I'm an, opt I'm an, I'm an optimist. But, but, but by the way, it's like if, if you're, uh, you know, if you're, if you're jumping out of an airplane and you've, you've never, uh, you know, you've you got to be an optimist that the, the parachute's going to open, right? Because if there's a, I mean, you just got to, you got you to jump. Sorry, go ahead. So, so uh, you showed uh, some of these, these numbers on how many startups fail. And yeah. Yeah. So I'm wondering whether you see a trend that with all the data and all the knowledge and uh, basically everything being digital, is there a trend towards having a, uh, an increasingly higher probability of success to predict the outcome? That's a great question. So there's a um, couple things. One, the, the, the failure rate is actually gone, going up in, in venture capital, actually, um, which is really interesting. Um, second, and I, so I can say this because they, so Harvard Business School um, is actually doing some really interesting things with AI, trying to basically compare how AI could select a company versus how, how people do. And so far, uh, and, I, I, and I, I probably can't disclose more than what I just said, but, but uh, well, and the conclusion, which is so far what the data, what is showing is the AI is about three times better. It, it, it's, it, it, kind of picking success. Um, and again, I think there's, we think Passport, you know, the, the, the GSV Labs Passport platform is going to be a tool that should enable, should be a resource to and provide both products and services and knowledge that should help companies um, you know, reduce the, the probability of failure. So, you know, I think it could be, it could be very interesting and positive. But, um, you know, the, the, the story is still being written.